Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Lunchbox Talk. This is the first in our summertime series. Um, <laughs> if you're joining us from Zoom, it's 76 and sunny here in Chapel Hill. Um, my name is Damon White. I'm director of the North Carolina Botanical Garden, and I'm joined by David Michaud, who will be assisting the Zoom audience for today's talk. Um, and it sounds like we have registrants from 23 different states. Um, uh, we're so glad you could join us for this very important program, Green Space as Cultural Space, Centering Native Leaders' Voices in Conservation Conversations. And um, the only reason I'm introducing the speaker is because one of the speakers is usually the introducer, and I'm going to save Joanna for last. Jessalyn Kaziah, um, on your right, if you're on the Zoom is a double graduate of Carolina, graduating with a BA in 2007 as a first-generation college student, then returning after a decade of work to graduate in 2020 with her master's in social work. She is a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina, and she currently serves as the Community Engagement Program Officer at the UNC American Indian Center, supporting community engagement among UNC community and all statewide tribal nations and native-led community programs. She works to leverage resources to support program development and bridge UNC resources with tribally self-determined initiatives. She also coordinates the Healthy Native North Carolinians Network and the new initiative to develop an American Indian cultural garden along with other community-oriented programming. Jessalyn, welcome. And we also have, um, and uh, by the way, these two are fresh off their global tour. They were just in Huntsville, Alabama, presenting at the American Public Garden Association Education Symposium. So uh, Joanna Lalikas is Director of Learning and Engagement here at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Since 2018, Joanna has provided overall leadership for the garden's education program, as well as community engagement programs, including the Carolina Community Garden, Edible Campus UNC, and Therapeutic Horticulture. Joanna facilitates strategic planning for and oversees design and implementation of learning and engagement programs that support the garden's mission. These programs provide diverse creative learning experiences that seek to inspire understanding, appreciation, and conservation of plants and advance sustainable relationships between people and nature. Joanna has master's degrees in both environmental sciences and landscape architecture and is a designer, organizer, educator, aspiring artist, and pattern designer. So, Please uh, give a warm welcome to Jessalyn and Joanna. All right, thank you so much, Damon, for that very nice introduction. And we're glad to have you all here with us today, um, both on Zoom and here in our audience on this beautiful day to be at the garden. So Damon did a, a great introduction of us and we can add to that if we need to as we go along. And, um, we both wanted to introduce our, um, our organizations. And yes, as Damon mentioned last week, we were in Huntsville and we shared this very similar presentation. We have a bit more time today, so we're going to go in a little more depth on some things. As I know there may be some folks on Zoom who were with us last week or who didn't make it to this session. So we're grateful to be able to have this opportunity. And um, I've been in partnership with the American Indian Center since about since the time I got to the garden, 2018, 2019. And it's been a real honor for me to share in this work and work shoulder to shoulder with Randy Bird, who was in Jesselyn's position before Jesselyn and now with Jesselyn. And uh, I've had folks uh, ask me over time, um, uh, about how we're working in community and what um, our partnership looks like. And so we felt like it was a great opportunity to be able to share this work um, more broadly, both in Huntsville and now here today. All right, so um, Damon gave a brief introduction to the North Carolina Botanical Garden. So we are part of the teaching research and public, public service 
um, aspects of the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And we have a strong focus on conserving the biodiversity of native plants native to the southeastern United States and have a history of a strong history of tangible benefits from that area. And we're really interested in uplifting indigenous knowledge and conservation leadership in this realm. And it's a change in perspective for me that I've gained through this partnership is we're talking about native plants to this land and native people have been in the longest ancestral relationship with these plants and this land. So it's so important for us to be in relationship and to learn um, from this long history of understanding this place. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Jesslyn and have her introduce herself more and the American Indian Center. Thank you. So yeah, my name is Jesslyn Kazaya. I am a citizen of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. We are the largest tribal nation east of the Mississippi and the largest in North Carolina, of course. I am here representing the American Indian Center which is a fantastic organization. We're based here at UNC Chapel Hill, but we work in service statewide with all of our tribal nations, urban Indian organizations, and native-led community work. And the, the mission of the American Indian Center is to bridge uh, the resources of what are on campus with the work that's happening out in our tribal nations. And so it's a very unique place because as we know, UNC, Chapel Hill prides itself on being the first public university on this land. And so to be in relationship with the first people of this land um, and make sure that we have service outlets, it really fills a hole um, and provides really meaningful resources. So we do have four service areas, which you can see here on our medicine wheel, native community engagement, and that happens off campus um, as well as on. Our student engagement, we do have a large population of native students here at UNC. We're very fortunate for that. Many of them come to UNC specifically because of the resources of the American Indian Center. We do hear that often. We have campus community engagement programs and we do engage scholarship. So um, research that's happening with native communities and uplifting those avenues. And so we do have understanding just of the native priorities around plants, conservation, those types of programming. And as Joanna mentioned, anytime that we're having conversations about land, anytime that we're having conversations about native plants, we have to also have conversations about native people. You'll often hear native people say, we are the land and we take that to be very true. We cannot separate ourselves. What defines our indigeneity is our relationship with this land. And so for me, this is also a very meaningful partnership um, to demonstrate what's possible when you partner with native communities in a meaningful partnership as an active word, right? Partnership meaning something tangible, partnership meaning something reciprocal, a true relationship. So I honestly believe that our work is a model for what's possible with other resource agencies and any conservation-based or land-based groups locally statewide, nationally. Um, I do come from a background in environment and conservation work, and there's just so many intersections with our communities. It's also full circle for me because I've always loved the botanical garden. Even when I was in undergrad here, I would come and volunteer at the botanical garden. Um, and that's because being from more rural North Carolina and having beautiful access to the woods and fields where I grew up, moving to Chapel Hill was a big move and the, the botanical garden provided that sanctuary. And I think that's also a way that um, our communities view that as a place of sanctuary. Wonderful, thank you. So shall I start? Um, you heard Damon share the botanical gardens indigenous land acknowledgement. And uh, I'll say that that came about about a year, year and a half ago. And it was after we were in deep partnership with the work um, of the American Indian Center. And it was kind of stepping back to say, okay, we are in, we are taking action and, and uplifting indigenous voices and working with the American Indian Center on development of a cultural garden. And we haven't acknowledged the, the land, um, that this land is native land. And so we took a moment to research 
history of the land. To, we were already in relationship with um, Native peoples and some very generously gave us input as we worked through that process, including Jesslyn. And so we were really grateful for that. And there's a lot of conversation around indigenous land acknowledgements. And Jesslyn wants to share a bit about kind of the practice of developing that and um, how to go about that and what to think about. Yeah, so I think land acknowledgements have come to prominence in the last few years. And we see a really wide range of what that might look like. So what I appreciate about the botanical garden is um, the soul searching that comes through and honestly doing that internal digging to what is your relationship with the land? What is your relationship with the people of this land? And I'll say, we often at the American Indian Center get requests from people that we write them a land acknowledgement. Um, and that is definitely not the purpose of a land acknowledgement, right? It's It really is for organizations, for stewards who hold land to, I, to do that internal identification of their own relationship, where that comes from. And for me, it, it, it seems more, and people have different opinions, right, on land acknowledgements. Native people have different opinions. From my perspective, a land acknowledgement is a very first step and a baseline, right? Um, and words are hollow without action. So to acknowledge that you are stewarding land that is native land, right, is one thing. And then to ask yourself, how is my stewardship of this land what is that relationship with, with Native people? And do they have access to this land? Do they have access to our programming? Um, are we doing this in ways that actually benefit the Native community to whom this land ultimately, and we don't even use the word belongs, right? Um, we belong to the land, right? The land is not property um, that belongs to us in, in that Native worldview, right? So we just gave this presentation at this conference in Alabama and um, it was highly sought after at the conference, lots of different gardens um, doing that own work and digging. And so you'll see Alabama um, featured up here as an example of how folks can start to identify their own communities. So you see the, the map here of the tribal nations and the urban Indian organizations in North Carolina. And I'll just take a moment to make sure that we speak each of their names into this space. So starting in the green down in Sampson and Harnett County, we have the Kohari. In the red, in the western part of the state, we have the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. The blue up in the northeast, we have the Halawa Saponi in Halifax and Warren County. That's where Halawa comes from, Halifax and Warren. Down in the light blue bottom part of the state, that's my people, the Lumbee, largest tribe in the east. In the brown up in the northeast, we have the Meharan. In the orange right here locally, we have the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation. In the pink just above in Person County, we have the Saponi. You might notice there's multiple Saponi, right? And uh, shared history, language, right? And down in the purple in Bladen and Columbus County, we have the Wakamasuan. And then we do have four urban Indian organizations. Here locally, we have Triangle Native American Society. Down in Charlotte, there's Metrolina Native American Association, um, Cumberland County Association for Indian People, and um, Guilford Native American Association. So those are representatives where, for example, in the Triangle, we have a large Native community, intertribal, made up of many different people, and that's a way for us to all convene, find each other, have those relationships, build resources. So, if you're living in another state and looking to identify your own communities, um, there are just ways. So when we went down to Alabama, we made sure to look on the website for the official list of all the tribal nations that are recognized in Alabama. And um, that is a process. Different states have different relationships with their tribes. There are federally, federally recognized tribes. There are state recognized tribes. There are some tribes still in the process of recognition at one of those levels. That opens up a whole other conversation. The biggest question to ask is um, just recognizing that no matter where you are, there are native people there, period. We are here wherever, wherever you are. And especially in urban areas, 
um, about 77% of Native folks live in urban areas outside of our tribal territory. So we do have large populations wherever you go. The question is, are you in relationship with those people? And something, you know, I often get approached, how do I build relationship with my Native community? How do I start a relationship? And I think that we also have to recognize that that relationship already exists just by proxy of you being on native land. So maybe that relationship hasn't been very active. Maybe it in some cases has been neglectful or there's been some gatekeeping or um, blocks there. And so I think a better question to ask is how can I be in better relationship with the native people who are around? Um, you'll hear me say the word relationship a billion times because that is just one of our core values in community. We really value being in relationship and in reciprocal relationship. Um, so we appreciate that tone that this partnership brings. And a question for anyone in organizations is how can we bring in native voices and recognize native leadership in this programming? So especially for environmental organizations, conservation organizations, plant organizations, we're already building on this huge depth of shared values, right? We already have these shared values around loving the land, loving the plants, wanting to conserve, wanting to work with the ecosystems, wanting to respect these individual identities of the land. And so that makes a really easy place actually to build relationship once you find those shared values. And you'll see as we step through examples of how that happens. So our story um, goes back since time immemorial, right? Because we are tied to the land. But the more active part of relationship started when uh, at the American Indian Center, we are um, a physically small organization. Our uh, office is this little old house, um, which we love. It's very, it's very um, cozy and we need bigger gathering space. And so because we do just love that access to nature, we've been hosting events for our Healthy Native North Carolinians Network other conferences and gatherings that we'll host, we would host them exactly in this room here at the Botanical Garden. That was an amazing resource and a way that during all the breaks, folks could go outside, um, be on the land. And so after years of that, it started stepping into a more active partnership, more intentional programming, collaboration between the two. And then a few years ago, that deepened through this idea of creating a native cultural garden here on campus. And so that's also bridging the work that's happening out in our tribal nations where there are community gardens and um, tribal gardens, medicinal gardens, um, all sorts of ways of stewarding that landscape. And so we wanted to bring that sense of home for our folks here in the Triangle, for our Native students on campus. And here in this room, we had a really beautiful community visioning session to identify what that would look like, to have what are the priorities that folks would want in a cultural garden. Had a beautiful conversation. That was about two weeks before COVID hit. And so we worked with the um, landscape architect to identify those priorities and start to map out what that plan looks like. We'll go into detail on that a little later in the presentation. Um, this is braiding together. And here we have a sweetgrass braid, which is a culturally significant plant one of our medicinal plants, braiding together that inherent indigenous conservation wisdom, recognizing that our people have had the longest relationship with this land and just the deepest knowledge of this land. And I, I love to share this example of working with um, one of our Kohari leaders, uh, Philip Bell. We were working with a GIS uh, professor here at the university and mapping out the Kohari River where they're stewarding over a hundred miles of the Kohari River. Um, and and Philip, who he's locally known as the Great Kohari River legend because of that just deep knowledge of the land, he's looking at the riverway as it's mapped on Google Maps, and he's like, no, this isn't the main run of the river. You know, historically, the main run of the river actually flows a little more this way. Over time, here's how the landscape has changed, and now it's mapped as this, but if it were restored to its proper balance, here's where the water flows. And so I think there's just those little ways of recognizing the inherent indigenous wisdom that doesn't always come with the letters behind the name or the degree in, in plant biology, um, but just recognizing those indigenous ways of knowing. So this slide is really, um, was a coming together of us to try and describe how our partnership 
flows and uh, started in conversation with, okay, well, for me, you know, for us at the Botanical Garden, asking Jesslyn, what is it about the Botanical Garden um, that makes this partnership work for you? And, uh, and likewise, I mean, some of, some of what is obvious with the American Indian Center to this work is their deep relationship and community. And that's, that's Jesslyn's whole job is to connect with community across the state. Uh, and so they have existing relationships. And then uh, they've been doing programming statewide uh, for, since 2006, I believe, is when the American Indian Center originated. And so they know what um, Native people across, across the state are looking for in terms of programming. Uh, and they're working both on campus and on, off campus with that. And indigenous perspectives, so, so critical to um, being able to engage in community when I am not a native person. So understanding all of those perspectives and also I'll say bringing cultural lens to this work. Uh, when I am engaging with folks who I am I do not share culture with, uh, I have questions about how to engage um, uh, respectfully sometimes or, or uh, just questions arise. And Jesslyn, and Randy, when she was here, have been just so generous in answering those questions uh, with humility and kindness and helping me grow and the Botanical Garden grow in our relationships in Native communities. So thank you for that. Thank you. And so what we can really appreciate in the Botanical Garden side of what's brought to this partnership, and this is something that is always this is a living relationship, right? So we're constantly revisiting this and thinking about ways that we can continue to grow, deepen, bring in other aspects. So I would say this is a living slide. It will continue to evolve. But we appreciate that the garden is making intentional space for native voices, making space for um, these types of lectures, programming, um, making space on the board for um, native representation, which is a huge shift and very meaningful work. Um, room for the meetings you know that's kind of that's where it started and that blossomed into something much larger those tangible resources of having that um tactile conservation knowledge and practice is very helpful and so seeds for example are a huge conversation in our community seed keeping seed saving making sure that we have access to our culturally relevant plants and so understanding um, the seed uh, saving and storage techniques here at the garden and how that can translate out into community priorities and community programs teaching plant preservation and cataloging skills i'm thinking about when we brought some wakamasuan elders to the herbarium and looked through the collections and understood how those um, plant pressings and the collections are organized so that that information can be held. That was a really beautiful day that has led to work that's happening on the ground in their community, doing those collections and pressings with their youth, which is really amazing. Um, plant starts for restoration work, and we'll talk about that even a little more with the garden, the, the garden that we're collectively putting together. Cultural humility, and I think this is a an, this is an very intentional word. Lots of times we'll see cultural competence as a way that this is phrased. And I think that assumes a lot of knowledge. And I really appreciate instead the tone of cultural humility, right? This way of um, entering where, okay, we know that there are these different cultural ways and how can we respectfully and humbly engage and always be in a process of learning because we always, as deep as a relationship can go, we always have more to learn about each other. So coming at that from humility, lays the ground for a very meaningful type of interaction. And then of course, professional development. This is something we're always thinking about for our students who are interested in this type of work. I, for example, when I came to UNC, I had no idea as a first generation college student, I had no idea of the types of jobs, the types of avenues that I could go into, although I was always a person really interested in nature, in the environment, in conservation. And so exposure to these types of fields is something that's very meaningful for our community. And so that's something that we're still exploring is how can we take that deeper. And then of course, that just that horticultural and conservation knowledge on staff, having such a um, knowledgeable staff with so many different areas of skill set is really helpful in modeling what's possible. And then we do have some shared 
Yeah, so um, you say at the bottom, the, the foundation of shared values and experiences, nature, ecosystems, native plants and land. And we talked a bit about that already. All right, and? So here's how we work in that overlap. Um, we do mutually design our programmings. That means lots of meetings um, to advance our partnership and um, building that relationship even beyond uh, just the emails and the back and forths to truly having a relationship with each other so that we can understand those priorities in a bigger vision type of way. Lots of very intentional conversations, lots of revisiting ourselves to make sure that we're staying in alignment and that type of self-assessment to make sure that we're on track with where our community wants us to be. So always having a listening ear to that community voice. And so I'm not gonna read off every one of these bullets, but this is a collection of what our partnership approach looks like. And so I'm wondering if you can just take a moment Look at these, you'll notice that they're all very reciprocal and very rooted in that relationship rather than assumption. And I'm wondering which of these boxes stands out to you. And so we do have a few folks in the room if you have anything to say about what stands out to you. And we can also have folks from Zoom add in the comments and then we'll take a little moment for conversation. So that was intentional inclusion of indigenous knowledge and that we have done it in some of our training and garden guide work, um, not as much on the nature trail, so opportunity to, um, to continue to grow in this work. Thank you. Definitely. Anything else standing out to folks? The native communities building opportunities for native yeah. voices and leadership. Okay, yeah, we'll be sharing some more about that. Yeah, and so we do have, um, we have had multiple different of these speaker events. Some of them have been lunchbox talks. Some have been gatherings that we've held in here. Um, one example, and we're gonna go through more examples in a slide later so you can see some of that work, but I'm thinking about uh, the Native Plant Symposium that we put together last year. And we do have recordings from some of those previous events and lectures. Um, and in that we featured um, all of the speakers were from different tribal nations around here speaking to that plant um, knowledge. So just making space for those voices. Anything else in the room on Zoom? Yeah. Overall, I detect a, a cultural humility that there is um, a prioritizing of indigenous voices um, in all of that so that the, the, the Euro white supremacy doesn't overwhelm what you're suggesting. So it's that cultural humility. I was a noticing of cultural humility in all of the bullet points here. Mm -hmm. And that that's intentional work. Right. And that that's very intentional work to, to make space and bring in. And we're always taking finding ways that we can take that deeper. There's somebody at the back. I just was noticing the recurring theme, tracking back to something you said earlier, partnership, community, relationship, team it's there is that sort of bigger uh emphasis on being in things together and we for so long have not been doing that and i just really appreciate how it's baked in to every box yes yeah, so i appreciate that you're calling out um those those kind of key words and the themes all the way through community relationship the togetherness um, of really walking side by side and um and bringing our strengths together um, and, and that is, that's also working in native values, right? So um, that is something where, you know, when you're working in indigenous communities, you'll often see circles, even just as a symbol. But when we hold gatherings, we typically are sitting in a circle and really voices are included and respected from all sides. So that really is type of the values-based work that we bring into how we operate as a partnership. And we may have anything coming from Zoom. Don't wanna, don't wanna leave out the Zoom. Uh, from Zoom, building cultural competency. That includes allowing us as native people to also relearn the knowledge of what we've lost through cultural genocide. Thank you for sharing. Right, and so we're recognizing that um, the disconnection, historically the disconnection of native people from our own land, the disconnection of native people from our own plant traditions, from these own relationships, 
the deeper that we can take any of this partnership work does allow for more of that to come back to our community and also for more of what has been preserved in community to be lifted up in a respectful way. Thank you for that. And we could stay and talk about this all day, but we'll get a little more into the work and we will have more time for conversation at the end. So the American Indian Cultural Garden, let's we'll go yes. deeper into that. So here is the master plan, as you can see it from the American Indian Cultural Garden. Um, there is a QR code if you wanna scan that um, with your phone or on the screen, or you can find the link here to jump to the site. Um, we are in a fundraising stage, accepting all generous donations from folks moved by this work. So um, I mentioned the priorities of this does create that sanctuary space for our native community around here. This is something that's publicly accessible. It is on campus directly across the street from the American Indian Center. So um, from here, you can see the American Indian Center is at the top. Um, right through the word Indian is where we would walk across the street and begin on that trail. So Joanna's gonna drag us and cursor and walk us through the entryway and you'll see multiple specific sites. So we do have a planned space for planting a medicinal garden. This is something where um, we're thinking about how can this truly be a value to community? So as much as our folks love to come here to the botanical garden, this is a conservation garden where you don't touch gather from, you know, interact with the plants in that way. However, that is a, for us as Native people to actively be in relationship with plants, we need to be able to have that type of relationship, actual, you know, relationship holding the plants. And so for our students to be able to gather their traditional medicines, to be able to have access to those plants where they can actually be in that relationship, we will have intentional space for that here in this garden. There's also a medicine wheel as space that our folks can go. We have a prayer tree, which was a really beautiful moment envisioned by one of our Halawasa Pony elders. When we had that initial community charrette conversation, visioning this garden in the land, there was a very moving moment with one of our elders talking about the vision for a prayer tree where folks could go and find that sanctuary. And then when we walked the land, we noticed there already was a dogwood right there in the dogwood um, the Halawasa Pony, their powwow is always the blooming um, of the dogwood around April. And so that just stood out to us as, okay, well, here's the prayer tree. It's already here. Um, I'll take a moment just to say that I've always said about this land, this land already is a native cultural garden. We have pecan trees, there's muscadine vines, there's the dogwood, right? There's these wildflowers that are all culturally significant to us. So to me, it's just restoring the balance of recognizing this space as the cultural garden that it already is and then building it out a little more intentionally. Here in the back, um, the two features that we heard uh, continually from people was space for water, which is very culturally significant and symbolic and space for fire, right? Also very, very culturally significant. So around the fire pit and gathering area, which will also serve as space for talking circles and for our Cherokee coffee hour, which is a language preservation work headed by UNC professor Ben Fry, who's an Eastern Band Cherokee um, language preservationist. Um, the that gathering circle is in the back and we have intentions to plant eight cedar trees, which are a medicine tree around that one tree for each of the tribal nations in the state to stand witness over that space in that protective strong energy. And then you'll see the path through the back out through the woods. We've done lots of invasive clearings. Um, to uh, bring a little rejuvenation to that space and quiet space for meditation, contemplation for our students. They really just talked about needing space that they can get away and feel like they have a little space for themselves um, on UNC's campus, which is a big adjustment for many of our students coming up here. Um, space to go and practice their powwow dancing without folks coming up and asking them questions. What are you doing? What's going on? Um, space for them to be able to gather, space to study in a way that just feels good. So we're designing all of this around and then it loops all the way around. I should also mention just the partnership. What you see kind of grayed out slightly in the middle is the Carolina Campus Community Garden. Um, which we've also been in partnership. They do keep some supplies inside the room at the American Indian Center, um, just because we're right across the street. So we always have had that partnership there. And um, we do interact. These pieces are meant to be interactive. 
and they do have distinct uses. So we do have a delineation of here's the cultural garden space and here's the campus community garden space. We're in partnership and they each have a unique feel and intention of that space. For those not familiar with the community garden, it is a, an existing engagement program of the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jesslyn. So as Jesslyn mentioned, this cultural garden is where this deepening in relationship really began. It was a beautiful day in this space. And then we, uh, we had some delays in, in moving it forward because of pandemic and, um, and other reasons. But uh, so we, we didn't want to lose the energy that had been in the space in that day. And so we made a, a conscious decision to begin doing some programming in the spirit of the garden. Uh, of course, there will be programming in that garden in the future once it's physically constructed, it's being used, that space is being used already. And we wanted to continue kind of this work uh, in the spirit of the garden. So we had a native plant uh, symposium in 2021, I believe yes. it was. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the way that came together is uh, Jesslyn uh, pulled together a group of native leaders uh, to support in planning that program, uh, as well as bringing her own deep knowledge of what was of interest to community. And so we featured four tribal um, nations, uh, their leaders, some of their leaders at the event. And um, it was a, a beautiful day. We had 85 people attending. It was hybrid, just like this is today. So some people in the room and some people joining uh, virtually. And based on those relationships, uh, some other things transpired. Uh, we've all, and which I'll share momentarily, specifically with the Wakamasuang tribe. And we've also offered lectures that are up, uplifting native voices and native leadership in the conservation realm. Uh, and just listed here, Dr. Tracy Locklear, who's a member of the Lumbee tribe. She spoke about elderberry. Uh, Arvis Bowman and Robert Redhawk Eldridge, representing Lumbee and Saponi, uh, talked about native herbal plant remedies. And then Randy Bird, who you've heard me speak of already, uh, formerly with the American Indian Center and still doing amazing work nationally and beyond, uh, talked about some of the work uh, around people plant stories that are happening in native communities. Uh, and then Dr. Ryan Emanuel, our colleague over at Duke University, who is also Lumbee, uh, talked about environmental justice and incorporating indigenous perspectives into environmental decision-making, particularly on the coastal plain. And we are currently working on a climate change series uh, that will be coming soon. So stay tuned for that. So as a garden, we're also inviting native artists to participate in our sculpture in the garden program, as well as um, looking for native artists to, um, that can sell some of their wares in our garden shop. And recognizing that many of our land management strategies come from indigenous practice, like our use of fire and our landscapes. And so uh, hearing through Jesslyn that Native leaders are interested in how we do this, they do it on their land, and this opportunity for coming together and sharing of, of knowledge, so that peer learning. Um, and then, so I mentioned the Wakamasuan tribe. So <laughs> Ms. Sue Jacobs and Ms. Darlene Graham gave an amazing presentation and workshop at the Native Plant Symposium. And it, it was wonderful to hear them talking about the healing green, green space that they have developed and manage on their tribal lands. And the, the, the relationship resulted in them inviting the botanical garden down to their land. And <clears throat> here's some pictures of that visit. And I wanna reinforce to you that the work of the botanical garden is not me. <laughs> it is 
taking place across our departments. And so I wanted to name some of the other folks that have been involved with this work. Ainsley Briggs from the Horticulture Department. Uh, Neville Handel, who didn't go on this trip, but has, has supported removal of invasive plants on the cultural garden site. Johnny Randall was on this trip um, with our conservation department. Carol Ann McCormick was on this trip with our herbarium, and Jennifer Peterson was there. And Jennifer did a wonderful interview with these two amazing leaders that led to an article in our Conservation Gardener magazine. Just a few, uh, few, I want to say episodes back, but this is not a podcast. <laughs> Thank you. So we had a beautiful day on site. Uh, we learned about the corn uh, seed that had just recently been rematriated to this land. So it was it was of this land in the past, and uh, folks who were some keepers of that seed who were not native people brought it back to the land so that they could grow it here on the land. And you can see on the left, this huge, I will say the corn loved being back home. And if I can, if I can just speak it, so it's their variety is uh, called a Sea Island Flint corn, and so they're also right on the coast where there's lots of hurricanes that come through, right? And so they just speak about how um, miraculously perfect this corn is adapted to that ecosystem, where um, through the drought, even just the dew, the heavy dew was enough to um, feed that corn. And then when the hurricanes came, I mean, this is one of the tallest corn varieties I've ever seen. And it's a beautiful white corn, a dent corn with the little dent in each of the uh, kernels. And they said that the strong winds of the hurricane would blow, would blow, would blow, but it didn't snap the stalks of the corn. And then after the hurricane, it was looking just as healthy as it was before. And um, so they're also currently in process of growing this corn, growing the seed, distributing that within community and looking for ways. Apparently it's especially great for grits, which another, you know, shout out to indigenous um, ingenuity. If you appreciate grits, that is a cultural native food, right? So um, so look out for some Wakamakuan Sea Island Flint grits here to come in the short future. Great, thank you for adding that. So it was just a wonderful day out there. And you can see um, on the right, Ms. Darling Graham sharing about the, the healing green space. Uh, and that's very intentional that it's not called a garden. And as we learned in the, Jennifer's interview, it's healing, they see it as healing for people and healing for the plants. And that's that deep relationship. And you can see kind of on the middle right, we went out to kind of the wild fields that they had burned uh, earlier that year and looking at some of the wildflowers and each, you know, both groups, um, both the Botanical Garden and uh, Ms. Sue and Ms. Darlene talking about and identifying the plants that we know out there. And this is land of the Venus flytrap. So we heard stories of how some of the elders there uh, would play in and around and with Venus flytraps, but there's not, they are not aware of Venus flytrap on the land anymore. And so that has um, evolved into further conversation with Johnny and with Heather Summer here, who does uh, propagation of Venus flytrap and other partners in community, both the Nature Conservancy that uh, oversees the green swamp nearby, as well as the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, who is working on a program to engage um, youth in elementary schools with Venus flytraps, coming to, kind of a coming together um, to add Venus flytraps to the healing green space and potentially more broadly on that land in the future. So. If I can say just one more thing, a mm -hmm. uh, couple a couple significant points there. So we do know that Venus flytraps um, are one of the most charismatic and recognized plants, even just worldwide in the plant community. Folks know about Venus flytraps. They only occur in a very small area, and all of that is Wakamasu on land. So this is very specifically a relationship to honor with this community. It was amazing to hear the elders talking about playing with the Venus flytraps, feeding them little bugs from their grandmother's yard, right, and just having those relationships. They also have 
about the most sundews I've ever seen just right outside in their um, tribal grounds in the back. And so it's really just amazing. And um, the star grass, all these different plants that they've had relationship with. So I would say that it almost felt like a play day, just all of the horticulture staff and um, the folks who just have these deep relationship with the plants out in the field for hours running around this plant, this plant telling stories. Um, and then the Venus flytrap propagation also is a way of engaging some programming they have on the ground that's been a really successful statewide model. So um, one of their community leaders, Ashley Lomboy, um, took it upon herself a couple of years ago to start a um, STEM studio. So through their traditional indigenous education program, they've started the Waccamaw Suwan STEM studio where they're using traditional indigenous cultural ways to teach STEM education in a supplementary way with their youth. And this has been an incredibly successful program. It's a few years deep in the running and they recently were awarded North Carolina Environmental Educator of the Year as the tribe, you know, for the STEM studio. So this is a way of the Science Museum had this um, opportunity of engaging with classrooms. The Nature Conservancy has also partnered with Waccamaw Suwon around um, helping them regain access to their traditional lands there on the Green Swamp, which they steward. Um, and this is just a way where we saw all of these different conversations happening and said, okay, how do we bring everyone to the same table and get all of these ties um, tied together? And so lots more to come from that work. Absolutely. And this is just an image of the article. We have some here printed out for folks who are in the room who may not have seen it a couple of years or a year ago. Uh, and then David will share the link in the chat for those on Zoom. And I just um, really appreciated and just gained perspective from that conversation. And uh, I believe it was Ms. Darlene who shared the, this information that she had heard from Chief Mike Jacobs of the tribe. When you honor the plants, they will honor you and show their face. How many of you all have had that experience? You learn a plant and all of a sudden you see it, you see its face more around you. Um, I just, that framing of it was just so beautiful and touching to me. So we wanted to share a bit about the outcomes of our work and our lessons learned um, just overall in terms of both organizations really in this work to focus in on indigenous wisdom. Uh, we've increased visibility of native leadership and we'll continue to do that. We've increased the diversity of our botanical garden audience and then resources to native led work, both through um, learning in all directions uh, and shifts in perspectives that I've already talked about for myself and I know for others um, at the garden as well. And then raising visibility. We, we shared this at a national event last week and um, we've got a national audience today. So we're, we're grateful to have that opportunity to share this work and grateful to the American Indian Center for feeling like this partnership deserves that level of sharing. So uh, there's been systemic change, I would say, that's resulted from this work at the Botanical Garden. Uh, in some ways, the work has raised a mirror to the garden. Uh, we, were, we were working in the realm of increasing diversity in so many ways across our garden um, staff, board, and um, and attendance at the garden at the time. And it raised a mirror again and, and, and deepened our work in that realm. And since that time, we have increased the board diversity. And as Jessica mentioned, we, we have increased, um, we have added two native leaders to our board. Uh, and we added an indigenous land acknowledgement uh, to our programming and to our website. And um, this is more recently just revisioning what we've called the education department for so long um, as learning and engagement and reinforcing the perspective that learning is not one directional, that even an instructor in front of the room from the questions that are asked from a crowd is two way and working in community um, like we're doing with the American Indian Center as well as with our existing programs, the community gardens, edible campus, and therapeutic horticulture, working shoulder to shoulder in community uh, and making sure that we're relevant to community. And so 
those of you who've been here for a while heard me change my title a while back, and that's the reason, the reasons behind that is it's really stemmed from this work and changing perspectives. And Jessalyn, you want to share about the Native community? Yeah, so on our side, um, what this looks, what this has looked like is increased capacity and resources um, for our communities to be able to um, lean on the resources here at the garden, learn from them and build up that work that's happening out in community is very meaningful. Increasing or rebuilding trust with these institutions, right, with UNC Chapel Hill, right? And I will just be very honest that I've seen ways of the university going out to engage with communities that have been more harmful than helpful, that have been more extractive rather than truly in relationship and partnership. And so this is a model of uh, what true partnership can look like. And this is a model that honestly I uphold when we're going around campus or when we're approached from other areas that are looking to be in partnership. There's many folks who want to be in partnership truly in name only, right? And so that is not aligned with our values. And what we do value is that true relationship and reciprocity, mutual exchange, um, and, and kind of bringing our whole selves to the conversation. So that's a model that um, has allowed for other work to learn what's possible and try to follow in these footsteps. It's increased opportunities for our um, community, for those voices to be lifted up in these spaces where maybe those voices haven't been heard or invited. Um, and then the cultural garden that we're creating presents many opportunities for internships, for professional development. I have professors all around campus knocking down my door like, when is it open? I wanna bring my class out to be volunteers. It's outdoor educational space, outdoor classroom space. A number of these programmings, once the garden is physically built, we'll be hosting them in that space. Um, I will say the grand irony is that we've been planning the cultural garden through the time of COVID, and it's exactly what we've needed all along is that safe outdoor gathering space where we can host large events. We already host events just on the open lawn that's there, but to turn that into a more intentional space. Um, and that's something that the local area really appreciates as a way of beautification and making that more intentional. And then the network that we've built through all of this um, expands opportunities for our tribal and community leaders to plug into work that's happening. Thank you. I'll also just say when we were presenting these outcomes in the partnership at the uh, American Public Gardens Association education conference uh, or symposium last week, we were absolutely slammed with requests from other gardens wanting to do this work, wanting to enter into respectful partnership and trying to learn from what's possible. So I do know we have friends here from that and appreciate you being here. And I think this is something that not only every garden, but all different organizations who are working with land and native plants have opportunities to engage in these meaningful ways. Great, we are almost finished here. And I really want to invite you all to join us. Uh, we had the honor this year for our Evelyn McNeil Sims Native Plant Lecture to have Dr. Lila, Lila June Johnston to join us. And she'll be talking about indigenous regenerative land management. And her PhD focused on this very recently, really thinking of indigenous peoples as architects of abundance. So please join us for that. You can scan this QR code or you can go to our events page and sign up for that. And that is a free event. It will be Sunday, April 2nd at 5.30 p.m. So this is our close and I, I chose, we chose this image up in the left corner because um, it's abundant out on Wakamasuan land. And do you notice the star shape in the center? And there is a beautiful kind of coming together around this plant there. Because the Wakamasuan are known as, they are the people of the falling star. And so they really kind of appreciated this plant and it spoke to them in that way as well. And I guess we'll just open it up to questions here or, yeah. or later if folks want to email us or connect with us later. So, and we have just a couple of minutes here. If Jessalyn is open to extending that a little bit, we can um, stay a bit longer for Q&A and also give you all permission to head out since we're gonna go a little bit over for that. 
Thank you. Thank you all for being here. If there's any questions in the room, I'll take those. Um, I'll bring this microphone over to you. I don't see any on Zoom yet. Any in the room? Uh, we did have one on Zoom, um, which was um, if there's a web page where the American Indian Cultural Garden Plan can be viewed. Yes. So uh, on the American Indian Center website, we do have a landing page for the cultural garden. It is Actually, our ambassador, one of our student ambassadors is working on it, and I think it just went live. So if you go to the American Indian Center under our initiatives, um, you can find a page about the cultural garden. The QR, there was one of the QR codes on here that also links to a landing page where you're able to um, donate and also learn more about that garden space. And if you know anyone who's interested in um, providing resources towards this, like I said, we are in a major um, fundraising stage and groundbreaking and implementation um, happening this spring. Any other questions in the room? Yeah. I was interested um, that you said you had lost a lot of the native um, knowledge of the plants. And do you have any explanation for how it, the rejuvenation has been coming about? Yeah, I appreciate your thoughts on that. So um, here in North Carolina, we are um, in a region with just that longest history of colonization, right? Um, and the destruction of many of our lands and the traditions that go along with them. So that is something that as a community here locally, we're always battling with. And at the same time, I don't want to give the uh, insinuation that that all is lost because we've been very fortunate to have um, culture bearers and um, keepers of this wisdom who have held it very protected and maybe even underground held those traditions and that knowledge um, in a time that it can now be brought forth in a, in a safe um, way for us to be able to express our culture. So um, I'm thinking about you know, it wasn't until 1978, um, the um, American Indian Religious Freedom Act, which is, says religion, but really that um, there were so many bans on practicing cultural traditions um, up until 1978. And so we truly, you know, that's, that's almost up until my lifetime, right? I'm the first generation of my family who's not impacted by that. And so we're thankful to the folks who have kept that knowledge and kept those traditions and are now teaching back out in the community. There is also a certain balance of protecting some of the traditions and some of the cultural wisdom within communities, and then also making space for what can be shared publicly and what's appropriate to be shared publicly. So um, the connection really is about uh, there are more people who are in our community who are interested, who may not have grown up with one of those knowledge keepers in their family. So how do we make space for um, those knowledge keepers to be able to share um, traditions within community in a, in a respectful way? And so we're in a time of major just cultural um, visibility that's never happened before and resurgence um, of these traditions being taken up more widely. And so I remember asking one of my elders um, is this confirmation bias? Am I, you know, I'm so excited about this. I feel very grateful to be living right now in this time of that revitalization. And am I seeing it just because I want it so badly? And um, this is Mr. Greg Jacobs of the Kohari tribe. And, and he was like, no, Jocelyn, I've never seen anything like this moment in my lifetime. Just the attention, the appreciation, um, both from within our community, but also from outside of our community, people for the first time really respecting that, that native wisdom and wanting to learn from it um, rather than tell us to hide it away. And so um, there's just a huge moment of cultural shift and part of this work is in honoring that. Well, I already knew, I guess that the, um government was trying to uh, keep people from doing the fire uh, maintenance of the communities. Are there examples of, of other things that they made people stop doing? Um, and could you give, give some a one or two? <laughs> that's a long that's a long list. Um, yeah, truly of what what's not been allowed. but I think to me, I think the fire is, 
is one of the um, just most powerful examples where we know that there's so many species who are fire dependent, right? That we are not able to see um, those species of some of those wildflowers or some of the foods that the birds eat until we have that fire that regenerates that landscape. And so I'm thinking about when you look at early colonial writings, just about the abundance of this land, right? The, the grapes that are everywhere, the fruits, the orchards, the, the fish in the stream, the abundance of the wildlife, of the deer. Um, and that's, that's not something that happened in a vacuum. That's happened because our people have these stewardship practices that are regenerative into the land. So the way that we fish allows for the population of fish to become healthier and more vibrant over time, the way that we hunt, the way that we gather, you know, we have certain cultural traditions around when you're gathering. Um, and Robin Wall Kimmerer is actually coming to um, Guilford next week. She's an amazing native ethnobotanist, um, citizen Potawatomi. And um, she talks about the ways of respectfully gathering and never taking the first, never taking the last, never taking more than a small percentage. And um, there's just these certain ways of being able to manage. I'm also thinking about the water management practices. So for example, the Great Coherie River Initiative is working to restore the river. The river um, had been a safe place for community forever. They share their name with the Coherie River, Coherie being a Tuscarora word for driftwood. So, um, so many of the names, even just of our places around are, are these native words, right? And so um, the community had been separated from even being able to access the riverway or the land at all. It was in state management, had been fallen into disrepair, um, private land ownership. And so um, the, through the hurricanes and the storm debris and um, agricultural practices, um, so many areas of the water had gotten dammed up and clogged up. And so the tribe took it upon themselves to go and start that process of um, restoring those waterways. And now they have over a hundred miles cleaned out of those traditional waterways by practicing some of those, um, some of their own local management practices. And now there's kayak groups and ecotourism and um, so much involvement. Um, and now the Coherie River is really a shining jewel in the Southeast. Um, thank you all for being here. I do think we'll need to uh, close out today and thank you on Zoom and for everybody who's in the room with us today. And again, we're available for questions anytime. Our email addresses are here. So if you want to follow up in any way, please be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Jessalyn, so much.